radioactive fallout from political ambition and scientific ignorance now on BBC Two, a revealing look at Windscale, Britain's biggest nuclear disaster. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan met President Eisenhower to sign an agreement that would change Britain's relationship with America forever. But just days before, a fire had broken out at Windscale, the country's first nuclear reactor. I looked down onto a blazing inferno. Britain was on the brink of an unprecedented disaster. If it goes up, we will all go with it. The fire threatened to destroy the special relationship before it began. You could imagine bottom dropping out of Macmillan's stomach. Facing humiliation, Macmillan decided to keep the truth about Britain's worst nuclear disaster secret. He covered it up, plain and simple. Now, secret tape recordings reveal the reasons behind Macmillan's cover-up. At first, they said if it went over 1,200, oh, God help us. And why the men and women who fought the fire felt he betrayed them. This is a story of political spin before the phrase was invented and how Britain's nuclear hopes turned into a nuclear nightmare. I have never been so frightened in my whole life. Mankind had not faced anything like this ever before. A country that had suffered six years of war, Windscale was a symbol of the new Britain, a symbol of hope. It was a massive engineering project employing thousands of people at the frontiers of science. It was the first big construction site that I'd ever been on. It was like Meccano on a very large scale. Oh, it was a terrific achievement, really. Yes. Uh, there was a lot of people worked on that. And these were huge projects. I mean, they wouldn't be considered huge today, but then they were. From 1947, the building of Britain's first nuclear reactor at Windscale took on epic proportions. 4,000 tonnes of graphite were used to build the two reactors. The walls were seven feet thick, the chimney 400 feet high. Occasionally they let me drive their cranes. and It was fun, it was like sort of model railways on a larger scale. The windscale reactor was um, a marvelous way of cutting our teeth. This, is, this sounds very egocentric, but this is to some extent the way that science goes. You do it because it's fun. Suddenly, science was sexy. Morning. Morning. More VIPs? No, boffins. Everybody loves a lover. I'm a lover. Everybody loves me. Anyhow, that's how I feel. Wow, I feel just like a Pollyanna. It was just part of this feeling that science is going to, has done great things, can do great things, and will do great things, and we were just part of it. If um, one of us went to a conference, there might be newspaper headline, uh, Atom Man will be there. It was very, very heady. More than 5,000 atom men and women landed in a small part of the northwest of England. The locals came up with their own names for the invaders. Probably the favourite was the Atomics to describe the new people in the village. I can remember um, all laughing one morning because of the headline, Britain's Atom Age Heroes. And you did feel that uh, we were in the vanguard of bringing something really new. 
men dressed like visitors from Mars add a slightly sinister touch to the hospital atmosphere of the laboratory. The local town of Seascale, just a few hundred yards from the site, was becoming Britain's first atomic town. Seascale was an absolutely marvellous place to grow up. It really was. There were golf classes, a riding school, ballroom dancing classes, ballet classes, dance, tea dances even, in the Windscale Club. And all the um, physicists and their wives who came in were new from university, so it was a very young, vibrant population. All the people were uh, young and ambitious and uh, keen, alive. There was chemists, there was teachers, there was physicists, there was all kinds of people. People from all over the world. We all got on wonderfully well, and uh, it really was, was quite exciting. Seascale was called the brainiest town in Britain. It was the biggest concentration of honours degrees and PhDs of anywhere in the country. Well, it was quite hilarious at school. We couldn't have a physics teacher because they couldn't get anyone to come and teach us. And apparently it was because all the homework that came in, all the physics homework, the standard of it was far in advance of anything the physics teachers had ever heard of. The class my daughter was in, every child in the class passed the 11 plus, which had been unknown before. In a Britain still emerging from war, Windscale gave people hope. From a point of view of someone just leaving the universities and starting a new job, it was great because I was thrown in immediately with 20 or 30 or perhaps more other, mainly men, all in the same boat, and we were all staying at the whole hostel together, so we all went rock climbing together, and we all played rugby together, and uh, got drunk together, and went to the dance every Friday night in the hostel itself, which was quite the local scene. But Windscale wasn't built to fulfil the dreams of Britain's young atomic heroes. It was built to make bombs. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6th, Japanese time, the first atomic bomb struck an enemy target. The bomb which had ended the war was now seen as the means of keeping the peace. Britain believed its status as a world power was guaranteed by its relationship with America and their joint stewardship of the atom bomb. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organisation will be gained without a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America. Churchill believed Britain and America had formed a lasting nuclear partnership when British scientists helped build the atom bomb. Although the Americans had financed the bomb project at Los Alamos, a crucial contribution had been made by some of Britain's most brilliant scientists. But not everyone believed in a nuclear partnership between Britain and America. They created this war-winning weapon. The American taxpayer created it. Two billion dollars was spent on it. Unimaginable sum of money. And they felt in 1945 that the best way of ensuring that, uh, first of all, America stayed on top, and secondly, that there weren't nuclear wars uh, in with, you know, with rival nuclear powers, was to keep this thing to ourselves. It's ours. We paid for it. We're going to keep it to ourselves. The idea that the United States was the ideal caretaker for this profound and dangerous knowledge. Uh, you can smell the, the, the smoke of, of superiority, of arrogance. We did it. Uh, you helped a little, but, you know, really, we did it. 